Russian researchers in the late 1940s kept five people awake for a total of 15 days using an experimental gas-based stimulant. They were kept in a sealed environment to carefully monitor their oxygen intake so the gas simply didn't kill them, since it was toxic in high concentrations. This was before the advent of closed circuit cameras, so they only had microphones and a 5 inch thick glass porthole sized window in the chamber to monitor them. The chamber was stacked with books, cots to sleep on with no bedding, running water, and a toilet, as well as enough dried food to last all five for over a month. The test subjects were political prisoners deemed to be enemies of the state during World War II. And with that being said, everything was fine for the first five days. The subjects hardly complained, you know, having been promised falsely that they would be free that they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 30 days. Their conversations and activities were monitored, and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasingly traumatic incidences in their past. And the general tone in their conversations took a darker aspect after the fourth day mark. After five days, they started to complain about the circumstances and events that led them to where they were. And on top of that, they started to experience deep symptoms of severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other all together and began alternatively whispering into the microphone. And one way mirrored the portholes. Oddly, they seemed to think that they could win the trust of their experimenters by turning over their comrades, the other test subjects in captivity with them. At first, the researchers suspected that this was the ill effect of the gas. After nine days, the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of a chamber, repeatedly yelling at the top of his lungs for almost three hours straight. He continued attempting to scream, but he was only able to produce occasional squeaks. The researchers postulated that he had physically torn his vocal cords trying to scream. The most surprising thing about the behavior is how the other captives reacted to it. Or rather, they didn't seem to react to it at all. They continued whispering into the microphones until the second of the captives started to scream. The two non-screaming captives took the books apart and smeared page after page with their own feces and pasted them calmly over the glass portholes. The screaming promptly stopped. And also, so did the whispering. Another three days passed. The researchers checked the microphones hourly to make sure that they were working, since they thought it was impossible that absolutely no sound could be coming in with five people inside. The action consumption of the chamber indicated that all five must be alive. But in fact, not just all five were alive, but rather this would be the oxygen intake if all five of them were exercising at a very heavy, very strenuous level. On the morning of the 14th day, researchers did something they promised themselves they wouldn't do, and that was speak into the microphone to get a reaction out of the captives. We then announced, We are opening the chambers to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one of you your immediate freedom. To our surprise, we only heard a single phrase and a calm voice respond. We no longer wish to be freed. Debate broke out amongst us and the military forces funding the research. Unable to provoke any more responses using the intercom, it was finally decided to open the chambers on midnight of the 15th day. The chamber was flushed of stimulant gas and filled with fresh air, and immediately voices from the microphones began to object. Three different voices began begging, as if pleading for the life of their loved ones to turn the gas back on. The chamber was opened, and researchers were sent in to retrieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever, and so did the soldiers when they saw what the hell was inside there. Four of the five test subjects were still alive, although no one could rightly call the state of life any of them were in. The food rations for the past five days had not so much as been freaking touched. There were chunks of meat from the dead test subjects thighs and chest stuffed into the cha stuffed into the drain of the center of the chamber, blocking, blocking the drain and allowing four inches of water to accumulate on the floor. Precisely how much of that was water and the floor and not actually blood was never determined. 
all four surviving test subjects also had large portions of muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. The destruction of flesh and exposed bone on the fingertips indicated that the wounds were inflicted by hand, not with teeth, as the researchers initially thought. Closer examination of the position of the angles of the wounds indicated that indicated that all of them were self-inflicted. The abdominal organs below the rib cage of all four test subjects had been removed, while the heart and lungs and diaphragm remained in place. The skin and most of the muscles attached to the ribs had been ripped off, though, exposing the lungs through the rib cage. All the blood vessels and organs remained intact. They had just been taken out and lied on the floor, fanning out around the eviscerated but still living bodies of the test subjects. The digestive tracts of all four could be seen to be working digesting the food it recently ate. It quickly became apparent that they were digesting their own goddamn flesh they ripped off and eaten over the course of the days. Whilst most of the soldiers were Russian special operatives at the facility, still, many of them refused to return to the chamber to remove the last of the test subjects. They continued to scream to be left in a chamber and alternatively begged, no, no, demanded that the gas be turned back on so they couldn't fall asleep. To everyone's surprise, the test subjects put a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the Russian soldiers died from having his rope thrown out of his fucking neck and splattered onto the floor, while another was gravely injured by having his testicles ripped off and artillery tended in his legs severed by one of the test subjects' teeth. Another five soldiers lost their lives, if you count the ones that committed suicide in the weeks following the incident. In the struggle, one of the four living test subjects' spleen ruptured and bled out almost immediately. Now, the medical researchers attempted to sedate him, but this proved impossible. He was injected with more than ten times the normal human dose, morphine. And still, he thought like a carnivorous, struggling, dying animal breaking ribs and arms of one of the doctors. When the heart was, well, ceased to beat for a full two minutes after he bled out, there was a point where there was more air in his vascular system than blood. Even after it stopped, he continued to scream and flail for another three minutes, struggling and attacking anyone within its arm's reach, repeating the word, more, over and over and over, weaker and weaker, until he finally fell silent. Surviving three test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to the medical facility. The two with intact vocal cords continuously begging for the gas be turned back on to be kept awake. <sighs> the most injured of the three was taken to the only surgical operating room the facility had. In the process of preparing the subject to have his organs placed back within his body, found that he was effectively immune to the sedative that they gave him to prayer him for the surgery. He fought furiously against his restraints. When the anesthetic gas was brought out to put him under, he managed to tear through most of the way through the 4 inch wide leather strap on his wrist even though the weight of a 200 pound soldier was holding his wrist as well. It took little more anesthetic gas than normal to put him under. And the instant his eyes fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy of the test subject that died on the operating table, it was found that his blood had tripled the normal levels of oxygen, his muscles that were still attached to his skeleton were badly torn, and he had nine broken bones in his struggle to not be subdued. Most of them were from the force of his own muscles that he had exerted on them. The second survivor had been the first of the group of five to start screaming. His vocal cords destroyed, and he was unable to beg or object to surgery and he only reacted by shaking his head violently in disapproval when the anesthetic gas was brought near him. He shook his head yes when someone suggested, reluctantly, they try the surgery without any anesthetic, and did not react for the entire six-hour procedure of replacing his abdominal organs and attempting to recover them with whatever in the hell remained of his skin. The surgeon presiding stated repeatedly that this should be medically impossible for this patient to still be alive. One terrified, one terrified nurse assisting the surgery stated that she had seen the patient's mouth curl into a smile several times whenever his eyes met hers. 
When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly, attempting to talk while struggling. Assuming this must be something of a drastic importance, the surgeon had a pen and pad flushed out so the patient could write his message. It was simple. Keep cutting. The other two test subjects were given the same surgery, both without anesthetics as well. Although they had been injected with a paralytic for the duration of the operation, the surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation while the patients laughed continuously. Once paralyzed, the subjects could only follow the attending researchers with their eyes. Paralytics cleared the system in an abnormally short period of time, and soon they were trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak, they were again asking for the stimulant mat gas. The researchers tried asking why they had injured themselves, why they had ripped out their own guts, and why they were they wanted to be given the gas again. And the only response was I must remain awake. <sighs> After that, all three of our test subjects' restraints were reinforced and they were placed back into the chamber, awaiting uh, determination on what should be done with them. Now, we the researchers facing the wrath of our military benefactors for having failed the stated goals of our project, were considering euthanizing the surviving subjects. The commanding officer, an ex-KGB, instead saw potential and wanted to see what would happen if they were put back in the gas. Now, again, we strongly objected, but were clearly outmatched and overruled. In preparation for being sealed into the chamber again, the subjects were connected to an EEG monitor and had their strengths padded and re-restrained for long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise, all three had stopped struggling the moment it was let slip that they were going to be put back on the gas. It was obvious at this point that all three were putting up great struggles to remain awake. One of the subjects that could speak was humming loudly and continuously. The mute subject, however, was straining his leg against the leather bonds with all his might, first left, then right, then back to the left. Just something to focus on. The remaining subject was holding his head off the pillow and blinking rapidly. Having to be first to the wire to the EEG, most of, the, most of us were monitoring his brain waves in surprise. They were normal most of the time, but sometimes it flatlined incomplexibly. It looked as if he was repeatedly suffering brain death before returning to normal. As they focused on the paper scrolling out the brain waves onto the monitor, only the nurse saw his eyes slip shut at the same moment his head hit the pillow. His brain waves immediately changed to that of deep sleep, then flatlined for the last time as his heart simultaneously stopped. The only remaining test subject that could speak started screaming to be sealed in now. His brainwaves showed the same flat lines as the one who just died from falling asleep. The commander gave the order to seal the chamber with both the subjects inside, as well as three researchers. I was one of the name three, and in a moment of hysteria and blind rage, I simply pulled out my officer's gun and shot him point blank between the eyes. And then I turned a gun to the mute subject and blew his brains out as well for good measure. I then pointed a gun at the remaining subject, still restrained to the bed, as one of the remaining members of the medical research team fled the room. I won't be locked in here with these things! Not with you! Have you forgotten? So easily? We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. I then paused after listening to that wretched thing speak. <sighs> and then took a deep breath, quieted and shut my eyes, and aimed at the subject's heart. The EEG flatlined as the subject weakly choked out. So nearly free. 